Hi, I'm Pete Conrad, commander of Apollo 12. I'm Dick Gordon, command module pilot on Apollo 12. I'm Alan Bean, Apollo 12 lunar module pilot. And this is Willard Scott reporting from the Manned Spacecraft Center, Houston, Texas. In a moment, details of the next moon landing mission through the words of the men who will fly it. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents a special report, Flight to the Ocean of Storms, the mission of Apollo 12. The crew consists of three U.S. Navy commanders. Their vessels are appropriately named. The Yankee Clipper for the three-man command module and the Intrepid for the four-legged lunar module. The assignment, land on the moon. Charles Pete Conrad, 39-year-old native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you've flown in space twice before, aboard Gemini 5 and Gemini 11. Now, Apollo 12, the country's second manned moon landing. How do you feel about this? Well, of course, I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, this is uh, what we've uh, all been working for for the last seven years, really. The Gemini flights were preludes to this, and so I'm looking forward to it with uh, uh, not so much uh, uh, anticipation uh, from uh, uh, the fact that it's exciting, but it's sort of the culmination of uh, seven years worth of work. Well, now, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your career before you joined NASA? Did you start flying right after graduating from Princeton? Right. I uh, went right straight from uh, graduation to flight training in the Navy and spent uh, almost four years in a fighter squadron in Jacksonville, Florida. And then uh, I went to the Navy's test pilot school in uh, 1958. It's getting a while back, I have to scratch over the numbers. And uh, spent a year in armament test there and went back to the school as a uh, performance instructor and uh, uh, to teach uh, other Navy pilots how to be test pilots. And from there I went to the West Coast and was in one of the first uh, Phantom Squadrons on the West Coast. And at that time I uh, was accepted uh, in NASA as an astronaut. And, September of 1962, and I've been here ever since. Well, now, your flight plan to and from the moon, Pete, is very similar to last July's Apollo 11 mission. The landing sequence for you and Alan Bean will be just as difficult, if not more so. Your schedule currently offers the possibility of touching down near the Surveyor 3 spacecraft, which landed in the ocean of storms two and a half years ago. If you succeed in landing close to Surveyor, I understand that during your second three-hour period of service activity, you and Al might very well examine the surveyor and its surroundings, picking up carefully documented rock samples on the way. Is that right? Well, there, there are two possibilities. And the first one is that, that we do land close enough that it's really right at hand. When I say right at hand, within three or 400 feet. Then there's the possibility that, for some reason or another, it is close enough for us to walk to, but it's not readily at hand. It's, say, 2,000, 2,500 feet. In the uh, uh, latter case, we would plan our geology traverse so that at some point in that traverse we would wind up at the surveyor. And we, in other words, that's the most efficient way to utilize the time and just walking to it would be to do this documented sample in a route to the surveyor mm -hmm. and back from it. And of course the other is, is we can run a traverse anywhere we want to and come back to the spacecraft, leave the rocks, and then just wander over to the surveyor, which says we landed very, very close to it. In either event, when we get there, uh, I have a set of cutters that will be... Uh, now, this is a hand tool, right? Yes, it's a large set of bolt cutters is what it, it amounts to. And we have a bag. And uh, aside from the photographic uh, information that we should bring back about the surveyor, and Al is going to take the photographs, the other thing which would be interesting, and we have uh, four items which we're going to try and retrieve off the surveyor with the bolt cutters, and uh, that is, we don't need the bolt cutters for the glass, but there's some thermal glass that was mounted on it as a thermal shield. And this glass has been sitting out for 31 months exposed to micrometeorites, and uh, we can bring the glass back for them to examine. And the other thing that would be interesting would be a polished aluminum tube, which is relatively easy to cut off, which also has been exposed both to micrometeorites and the solar wind. And then there is the TV camera that is mounted on there that has some cabling to it. Now, they would like us to cut a sample of the cable off. And the last thing is the TV camera, which is a multitude of, of different kinds of parts. 
by bringing back that TV camera for analysis, the engineers would get a very good handle on the effects uh, of long duration exposure to the space environment on uh, materials and uh, would crank this into obviously later designs of both unmanned and manned satellites that you, you want to stay up and operate for a long time. So these are the, the bonus benefits that we'd get by making a spot landing next to the surveyor. We'll certainly be wishing you good luck on that landing, Pete Conrad. Thank you. Dick Gordon, 40 years old, born in Seattle, Washington. You've flown in space before with Pete Conrad, the rendezvous and docking and spacewalking mission of Gemini 11. When did you come into the astronaut program? I was selected in late 63 and moved to Houston, uh, New Year, arrived on New Year's Day in 1964. Well, now as command module pilot for Apollo 12, Dick, you'll continue to circle the moon while Pete and Alan Bean descend to explore the ocean of storms. Your job as a lunar orbit watchdog of sorts is sort of similar to that of Mike Collins during Apollo 11. Could you sort of summarize your responsibilities for us now? Well, I think by and large it's uh, fairly simple to describe those. It's basically the same as Mike's was. Uh, we jokingly, I guess maybe not jokingly, call ourselves the bus drivers. Uh, Pete and Al get in, I say leave the driving to me and away we go. Uh, it is a challenge in its own right. I am basically responsible uh, or have that responsibility after the launch and after the insertion in the translunar coast of uh, being cognizant of the, of the command module itself. Obviously they're there and they're with me and they know a great deal about it. But I think Pete uh, has genuinely left that responsibility with me and he's counted on me to fulfill that task of making sure that the command module does its job. In other words, it gets them to the to lunar orbit it fulfills its requirement for getting the lunar module ready. It uh, stands by in all cases to rescue the limb in the event that that has to be done. And of course, we all hope that it doesn't. That's a formidable task in itself. Uh, being responsible for the rendezvous itself after their lunar surface activities are completed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, coming back home, the navigation that must be done and, and the entry itself. These are the things that I'm responsible for. Well, now, Dick, after the service activities completed and Pete and Al are safely back inside your command ship, the flight plan calls for the three of you to spend an extra day in lunar orbit to photograph future Apollo landing sites. Do you consider this a major part of the Apollo 12 mission? It certainly is, and I think it's a very vital aspect of this flight. It's, it's an added feature, you might say, of our flight, and if, if you really look at it, it's exactly what Apollo 8 did on their flight, we've tacked that on as an addition to ours. But in that, that's an indication, I think, only of the amount of activity we'll be doing. And it is all basically surveying and basically photography for future Apollo flights. I think to make the future of Apollo interesting, captivating, and certainly scientifically valuable, we must go to the areas on the lunar surface that are the most interesting significantly as far as geology is concerned. Plus the fact that the techniques of, of spot landing with the limb have to be developed. We haven't done it yet. We're going to attempt it on this one. But the more we try and the more we do this, I think the more we'll learn so that someday we can, in fact, park that limb on a plateau that's right alongside of a mountain. Now this is the type of thing we're interested in. Well, thank you very much, Dick Gordon, and good luck to you during the flight. Thank you. Alan Bean, 37-year-old native of Wheeler, Texas, and a member of the astronaut team for going on seven years now. How do you feel about your first space flight to the surface of the moon, no less? Pretty happy, and I think it's been worth the wait. Really worth the wait? You said it. Now, when did you come into the uh, astronaut program, Al? I've been in since, uh, I think it's February of 1963, and uh, it's been uh, a constant train since then, and it's been... Uh, most interesting experience anyone could imagine. Al, you and Pete Conrad are scheduled to spend two separate three-hour periods out on the lunar surface. During the first EVA, plans call for deployment of five scientific experiments onto the surface. A seismometer to detect moonquakes and other instruments to measure the lunar environment. This package of experiments is nicknamed ALSEP. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about this? Okay, as you know, the uh, ALSEP, Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, is a combination of four or five, I, I use that, that 
word because one of them is, is a smaller and attached to another experiment that we're going to leave on the moon for forever but it has a guaranteed lifetime of, of about a year so it'll be sending back good scientific information for a year uh, we expect that uh, that it will operate then for another year just as well even though it doesn't have to and then after that we probably won't be, be using it but our job then is to put this this uh, package uh, out on the surface where it will uh, be best located to gain the information that it needs that it is able to gather and in a position where it won't uh, be disturbed when we actually ascend from the lunar surface. Now you'll be deploying these experiments some distance from the spacecraft, isn't that right? We will. Originally we were going to take it out two to three hundred feet, but as a result of Apollo 11 and some of the uh, uh, evaluations that have been done since then, we've decided that we probably ought to take it out, or the scientists have, and engineers that think about these things, decided that we ought to take it out about a thousand feet. That's a pretty fur piece when you're in a spacesuit. So I think we'll try to get it out there, and it depends on the terrain. If it's got a lot of hills and dales and we got other things, we might not get it out quite that far, but that's we're shooting for that neighborhood anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, Pete Conrad has already explained that during your second period of service activity, you hope to make it over to the Surveyor 3 landing site. But during both of your extravehicular periods, you'll also be concentrating on other things, gathering samples of lunar material, for example. Could you elaborate on this? As you well know, our, our first period outside is going to be devoted largely to ALSEP, actually putting out the, the experiments package. Then with what time we've got available left, which is, let's say, half an hour, three quarters an hour, it's hard to tell right now, we're going to do what we call a documented sample. And what we're going to do here is look around for as many different kinds of lunar rocks and lunar geological features we can see. We're going to take pictures of them and get as many different kinds of rocks as we can. We're going to load these rocks in the rock boxes and take them in with us in the first EVA. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, second time we get out, our main objective is to do a very good documented sample. And by documented sample, I mean we want to take a look at, once again, as many different kinds of lunar rocks as we can see, and many different kinds of unusual lunar geographical features as we can, we can spot. But we want to document them very accurately. For example, if we are going to collect a rock, Pete and I have a sort of skit, a rock dance, as I call it, that we go through. We move over to the rock. He steps cross sun to it by about four feet, and before he steps to this position, he puts down a gnomon. This gnomon is sort of like a little sundial where we can uh, cast a shadow near the rock, and you can tell the orientation of the rock relative to north or east or anywhere else. And you can also tell the tilt of it, and it also allows you to do some color matching because there's colors on this gnomon. He puts this down near the rock, and then he steps cross sun. I move in then to a down sun position, take a picture. He takes a stereo pair cross sun, and then starts to pick up the rocks with his tongs. I then get a sample bag, put the rock in the bag, maybe a quick discussion about any unusual features. A discussion that I understand will take place with scientists here on the ground. That's right. This is going to be one of the differences between our particular exploration and 11's. Uh, and also, I think we'll see it on all the following missions. As the lunar surface operation gets more complex, you're going to have to use the man on the surface to make on-the-spot observations and collections. But he isn't always going to have a lot of spare time to sit around and pontificate about just exactly what he's been seeing. So they're going to have a lot of scientists on Earth in the con Mission Control Center that are thinking, listening to what you're saying, thinking about what you're saying. They'll be reflecting, and they'll come back and give us some advice. And so this is going to be a a real team operation between the scientists on Earth and ourselves on the lunar surface. Well, Alan Bean will be watching and listening here at home, and good luck to you during the flight. Thank you. Astronaut Alan Bean, together with Pete Conrad and Richard Gordon, comments from Houston, Texas, about their upcoming Apollo 12 moon landing mission. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, has presented a special report, Flight to the Ocean of Storms, the mission of Apollo 12. This is Willard Scott speaking. <laughs>